wie gesagt, nochmal herzlich willkommen ähm, im Namen aller Veranstalter ähm, der Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. A warm welcome to all organizers, um, industry all, global union, global policy forum and Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and the Metal Workers Union. I'm Jan Leidecker from the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Geneva and uh, I work on international trade union policy uh, mainly. I started in September and uh, I used to work um, for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in uh, Southern Africa in Johannesburg, um, based in Johannesburg, and I worked on uh, similar issues. It's it's great to see you all, and I'm still um, getting used to the cold um, that uh, started to kick in. Um, well, um, a warm welcome to you all. We are meeting on the occasion of the seventh uh, session um, um, on the UN Treaty on Business and Human Rights to adopt uh, and to, to draft um, a binding uh, agreement uh, that should protect uh, human rights and increase the access to justice for victims of human rights abuses of uh, corporate um, abuse. Um, our assessment is that this uh, seventh uh, uh, session uh, has a clear dynamics. Uh, on the one hand, we have already uh, some clear bindings on business and human rights at the national level. The supply chain law in Germany um, uh, being one example, but also at the uh, European level, uh, due diligence uh, obligations um, are to be um, um, uh, enshrined into law. Um, prior to this session, uh, many uh, UN Special Rapporteurs and uh, human rights experts uh, have welcomed the adoption of a binding uh, treaty, of a binding agreement. So this um, the contradiction uh, between national um, legislation and, uh, and an international agreement uh, does not exist. Um, the U.S. is taking part for the first time, and they also recognized uh, the importance um, and the crucial role of uh, legally binding agreements and uh, regulations. However, there are critical voices that uh, question um, uh, such an uh, agreement or question the draft um, as it is right now. Uh, of course, we need to act uh, against uh, human rights abuses by corporations. We need more access uh, to justice for the victims. And we know that this will only be possible uh, through international cooperation. So all those who support such, an, uh, such a binding agreement, um, they are also in favor of uh, uh, very broad and uh, very powerful alliances. Uh, we know that we need uh, to build those alliances uh, on, from the perspective of the unions. Um, um, the unions have, a, have an important role to play because they have international networks and based on their history and their traditional role, they uh, can act as guarantors for social progress um, in, um, on a global level. They are social actors and they have uh, brought about a lot of progress uh, in the past and we need their power to exert the social and political pressure to uh, bring about a, a binding and a very uh, good agreement. Um, cooperation among the uh, uh, organizations that are present here in this meeting, uh, we have a long-standing uh, cooperation. So we've been working together for a long time and we uh, uh, work on these topics um, in, in specific ways. We've met last year uh, on the occasion of the sixth uh, session, and we met afterwards in various constellations to uh, move our work forward. So I'm really, um, I really appreciate that we are able to meet again to uh, make a further step in that direction of a binding agreement uh, to that will be um, uh, uh, that will help to enforce uh, the social and environmental and due diligence regulations uh, that we need. Um, I'm great to, um, uh, that you are with us um, and that uh, you have accepted our invitation as uh, speakers on the topic and um, uh, working in these areas. And on that note, um, I would like to uh, pass the floor to Horst Mund, who will moderate our session. Thank you, Jan. 
uh, for that introduction. My name is Horst Bund. I work in the international department of the Metalworkers Union, EG Metall. And as Jan said, uh, for uh, trade unions um, such as the Metalworkers Union, um, the topic of uh, human rights due diligence obligations is a very important, a crucial topic at national but also at international level. We've been demanding legally binding um, uh, uh, agreements for a long time. At the same time, because we did not know when this will come about, we also worked to um, to improve the voluntary um, uh, measures, the voluntary regulations and the uh, uh, global framework agreements as well. There are many of those out there, uh, but of course, um, it, it's uh, they can only do so much, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, overwhelming number of corporations in the world. Um, however, they can make a difference for workers um, as well, a crucial difference. So global framework agreements, we see them as an uh, addition to um, legally binding agreements. Uh, they do not replace them. Um, I always use the example global framework agreements are uh, something like um, um, they help us to uh, they are one uh, tool in our toolbox but we need uh, you know the overall structure we need the uh, toolbox um, 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 that uh, is enforceable at the national and international level, and Jan mentioned it. Uh, we need the national level, and we have the supply chain law in Germany. Uh, at European level, we are waiting for the draft uh, for of a directive um, that has been announced for the beginning of December, and since 2014, uh, they had a, a number of um, you know, sessions on the UN Treaty on Business on Human Rights, the organized uh, civil society, uh, we are part of that as uh, unions and our uh, federation is, uh, is of course larger uh, and uh, we have more agency and more scope of action. We saw that it took a long time and it took a lot of effort uh, to usher in the uh, Supply Chain Due Diligence uh, Act. Um, uh, and uh, given that experience, we know how hard it is to um, bring that about uh, at the European or even at the global level. But uh, we do not lose hope. Uh, we continue our work. Uh, we've been doing this work for a long time. So uh, we continue this struggle and uh, this event is to be understood as part of that as well. Um, our event will have three sections, uh, as you can see as you could see in the program. First of all, we will hear about experience uh, from the uh, shop floor, from the factories and from the sector. Um, we will hear from Kerstin Mai, from Bosch GmbH and from Apuna Akta from Bangladesh. And I will um, introduce uh, our speakers a bit more uh, in detail in a moment. Then these will be embedded, these uh, accounts will be embedded um, uh, into um, uh, an account from the uh, uh, ILO and from Industry All and Global Union. And in a third part, we will um, also involve uh, uh, representatives of the um, uh, German government um, and other uh, politicians and, and policy makers. Uh, we will hear from Carsten Stender. To talk about what it needs um, uh, from their side as well to um, to bring about a, a binding agreement. We have about 75 minutes left, so our time is very limited. Um, these side events, we do not have much time for them, so it, unfortunately, uh, we cannot allow much space for a lot of interaction. Um, so it will be difficult to take all question questions, but uh, we said that we can use the chat to collect some questions and I will try to pick some of those up. 
and address some of those questions, but please bear with us. We will not be able to uh, uh, address all the questions that you may have. And last but not least, um, on behalf of the Metal Workers Union, thank you to Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Industry All, and the Global Policy Forum. Uh, we have uh, co-organized this side event together. It's just one um, cog in a in the in a wheel. It's just one part of a, a chain of events, um, and one part of our um, struggle for a binding agreement. And um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Kerstin May. Um, what are we talking about when we uh, um, talk about the Bosch GmbH? What are your What is your experience with um, um, respecting uh, and upholding uh, human rights due diligence obligations in the uh, supply networks? It's not only supply chains; it's actually supply networks. Uh, Kerstin May is the head of the uh, company. Uh, works Council of the Bosch GmbH and the head of the uh, European Works Council uh, at of, of Bosch, and she is member also of the board um, of Bosch. Uh, Kerstin, you have the floor. vier unterschiedlichen Branchen, ähm, Mobilitätssektor, äh, Gebrauchsgüter, Maschinenbau und im Gebäude- und Energiesektor, ähm, teils unterteilt sich operativ in 15 Sparten oder Divisionen, die das operative Geschäft führen, eigenes Portfolio haben, eigene Wirtschaftsplanung machen und in gewissem Sinne wie eigene Unternehmen auch gesteuert werden. Es gibt vier Zentralabteilungen, die als Dienstleistung oder als Governance-Bereiche äh, fungieren und sozusagen die operativen Einheiten unterstützen. Weltweit sind wir rund 390.000 Beschäftigte und davon rund 50, 50 Prozent in Europa. Ähm, der Europäische Betriebsrat existiert seit 1998. Ähm, wir sind, haben 24 Länder in der Vertretung. Und davon sind drei Gastländer, ähm, Schweiz, Türkei und jetzt seit dem letzten Jahr auch Serbien mit dabei. Ähm, unsere, unser globales Rahmenabkommen hat, nennt sich Grundsätze der sozialen Verantwortung bei Bosch ähm, und existiert seit 2004. Da sind wir bei der Einführung schon, zweite Seite. Und da werden wir bei den, ähm, äh, sage ich mal, wie gehen wir heute mit den Themen um? Ich soll noch mal von vorne anfangen. Nee, die englische Übersetzung. Ich habe gerade einen Chat. Okay, now it is working. Okay, so the third. Okay, so next slide. How do we deal with social responsibility today? So we have two tiers. Internally, Bosch has committed to um, to tier one, which means that it obliges the suppliers to contract the same rules to the next level. And then we also have an audit system, which is also used. It's a product side that is audited, but also global framework conditions and environmental conditions that we audit. This is especially important when it comes to new contractors and new contracts with new suppliers. And in the European Works Council, we are the responsive committee, which is actually supervising that the suppliers and subcontractors fulfill the obligations. And we are also responsible to monitor if there are um, infringements, if they don't fulfill the social responsibility, and we 
also address the central departments to get an official statement in case we get information about unsocial or unfair circumstances. So focus, our focus is on a tier one level. However, we also oblige, as I just said, the suppliers to apply the same rules to their respective next level. So just to give you an overview on the scope, we have around 25,000 tier one suppliers on a global level. So it's a big number and you can imagine that it's a lot. So we have to say or admit that it's kind of a reactive system. So we react whenever we gain knowledge about it. So if we, for example, um, gain knowledge about um, bad situations, bad working situations, bad working conditions, we try to contact the local management that is in contact with the suppliers. Typical examples that I can give you if, for example, employees try to organize within a union, we have been having um, three cases in Turkey that have been kind of comprehensive. So we try to actually come to the point where we can have collective agreements. And then there's always the situation that the management of suppliers does not agree with these internal mechanisms and they try to hinder the whole process. And the effect is that we see this and we say it's not okay and then we step in. So we try to supervise it and if the situation gets worse, Bosch can also sanction their supplies. However, it's um, a matter of a private economy, so there are always limits. And we can only be or act on site whenever we gain knowledge about it. So we really depend on our international network and our colleagues. Um, let me give you an example of the Uyghur population in China. So Bosch was accused of being part of this system of injustice. But thanks to a request from industry all, we could carry out a research at Bosch and could find out within our limits that that was not part of the internal Bosch structure, for example. So all these elements can help the industries to actually um, investigate accusations within the company but also in other locations so it also helps us whenever these topics come up to have a channel where we can talk about it and communicate with our colleagues this does not only apply to the supplier network but it holds true for all the bosch sites in europe and worldwide so whenever we gain knowledge about problems we use the same mechanism and we try to discuss and address these problems and of course try to eliminate them so what's next what can we expect so this is um actually or this will hold true as of 2023 based on german law During the last session of the European Works Council, we have also heard about what Bosch will do. And the first activities already started. Of course, also everything needs preparation. We had a meeting in September where we published a comprehensive report on activities of Bosch regarding the new supply chain law. So what we can see right now is that we will have seven tiers. So from tier one to tier seven, um, more than 25,000 are in tier one. We think that we will introduce a risk-based management system. So we have to identify risks, 
We have to identify the focus areas. And of course, it's clear that it's not only a matter of purchasing, but also labor law, the Department of Labor Law, but also the de department responsible for environmental protection will have to be included. So of course, we welcome this initiative. We think that this will provide a strong framework that can give and provide orientation. It will help to prevent bad working conditions, especially in terms of international competitiveness. And when it comes to prizes, for example, you know that the there's international pressure. And still we have to make sure that the working conditions are good and the conditions are fair. So these frameworks help to provide a legal frame. And this is why I also support my colleague's statement, what Horst Wundt said. We still need these global framework agreements because it's not the case in all locations that people actually try to make use of legal remedies. Sometimes they still need support, extra support from their company, but also from unions. And this is where we step into the game. We still want to help. We're still necessary in order to help employees. And these things can exist in all states, also in Germany, if there's a lot of pressure on your job. So I think um, this will be a dual system in the future. And of course, we has also have to see how everything evolves and develops. And I think that social issues are very important, but I also think it's a good thing that in the environment is taken into account because this will influence the working conditions. Okay, Kerstin, so I would like to ask you to come to an end, but thank you for this complex presentation. Thank you so much. I know that there are many questions. I also see in the chat that there have also been questions that were posted, but as we have a limited amount of time, I would like to ask um, Kalpona Akta to speak. She's the president of the Bangladesh Garment and Industrial Workers Federation, and she's also the founder of for the Center of Workers Solidarity in Bangladesh. So Bangladesh is one of the countries where the textile and garment industry is really central and it has been a hotspot for textile and garment industry for many decades. We all remember the tragedy of Rana Plaza in 2013 when the factory collapsed. It has gained international knowledge. We know that the labor and also the human rights situation for the people that produce these textile and garments is very bad. you to briefly uh, uh, give us a, a picture of the working uh, condition in uh, Bangladesh, but uh, also um, uh, talk about the Bangladesh on uh, building and fire safety and its successor um, uh, agreement that went into um, operation in September um, this year, the international accord. So in all this in 10 minutes, which is something uh, next to impossible, but uh, uh, well, you, I'm sure you manage. Sure. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, in giving me opportunity to speak in this important panel. So the working condition in Bangladesh, uh, you know, it's, it's not different than other production country who produce uh, garments for Western countries here. So we have 4 million workers whom majority are women making clothes for West, Western countries uh, with a poor wages, long shifting hour, with retaliation when we try to organize, uh, but our workers are brave enough to also fight back. So when we defeated being organizing, we also fight back and organize 
and uh, you know, raise our voice and ask for our demands. So at this moment, you know, the pandemic really made situation drier in our countries. Uh, like last year, uh, in, in the beginning of pandemic, over 300,000 workers lost their job, whom majority was women worker, and they went back home with empty hand while they have given years in the industry to make it profit. But the brands, retailers, and the manufacturers did not hold their back when it was crucial to uh, you know, help them and uh, giving them an economic support. So at this, in these days, the situation is little better because due to Delta variant in India has been puzzled. So many orders are coming to Bangladesh and due to the political instability in, um, in Myanmar, many brands also uh, you know, giving their orders to Bangladesh. So as you know that Bangladesh is second largest apparel producer. So now the workers, those has been lost their job last year, they started coming back uh, to the industry. But there are many issues still there, like waste theft, uh, not paying the severances. Uh, there is the issue of gender-based violence. Those we are facing in here, but unions are dealing with that. We feel that together will be strong and will be defeated these problems. So, and other piece that, you know, uh, that everyone knows about Bangladesh is because of Rana Plaza and that comes safety. So the safety, uh, the factory building safety was vulnerable even eight years ago. We had to experience over hundred workers dies in a factory fire or collapses. It was that common. But the, 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 the globe, the people around the world only wake up when we lost 1138 workers at Rana Plaza collapse. But that wasn't the first one. Uh, there was many more collapse and many more uh, you know, uh, fire accident. But due to the corporate self uh, approach, the things never has been changed. But now we can say that our workers are, majority of our workers are working in a safe working places. And that phenomenal, has, uh, phenomenal change has done by the Accord on Bangladesh Fire and Building Safety, which has been signed between Global Union and with the brands and retailers in back 2013. And the change was able to make because it was legally binding agreement. It has given a scope for workers to join in the inspections, went to workers with a follow-up report. So the workers has been included in every process. The first time we have seen that the factories are putting the fire doors to save workers' lives because the inspection has found over 100,000 of hazards during their inspections. So when I said that we had to experience over 100 workers dying in a factory fire and collapses, in 2016, after three years of accord work, the death toll was zero. So it is that difference has been made. Again, I wanted to repeat this, the difference made because the legally binding agreement, the brands knew that if they do not uh, you know, abide by the clauses, then they, there is a consequences, which they never had in their code of conduct or corporate social responsibility. And in September, we were able to bring this accord in an international level. After months of fight, our global unions has been done, all the affiliates, we have been done together globally and asking these brands that the progress that has been made in Bangladesh that need to be protected. And this should be taken to other country as well, where we are losing our brother and sisters in a factory fire or collapses. So with that demand, our global union really has been done an amazing job along with other allies. Now a code is signed by 146 brands and it's an international agreement now. And we are hoping that within a six months that a code will be uh, start working one other country in South Asia uh, or wherever it is needed, the feasible study is uh, you know, ongoing.
And it is a 26 months agreement for now, which has amazing elements. And there is a possibility that uh, human rights due diligence can be included. It is a, it's not a mandatory now for this moment, but if everyone agrees that can be mandatory as well. So I cannot stop harassing that how, how uh, you know, important is a code for the country like Bangladesh where safety is vulnerable, the country like Pakistan or country uh, like in other production country. So I just wanted to say that, you know, self-regulatory corporate uh, approaches never helped. We found those are always empty promises. So if we wanted to make changes, we need a binding agreement in every level. And in this, um, you know, this accord, it's not only just look for uh, building fire and structural, it will be look for health and safety as a whole. So it's way improved. So the, you know, I will be asking the brands who didn't sign yet, they should be signed. And whenever we are talking about agreement, let's do it binding. The union, we support a binding agreement. Over to you, Brother Host. And if there is any question, I'll be happy to respond later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Kalpuna. You did great in respecting the time. Uh, um, so thank you uh, for that. Um, I'm switching to, briefly to German. Uh, aus dem Chat sehe ich eine uh, Frage jetzt schon an Kerstin May. Uh, I see uh, a question in uh, the chat uh, already. Um, würde, to Kerstin May, uh, I'd like to pick that up is, uh, uh, so that you can address it. Uh, the oppression of unions and, uh, uh, its, um and their members, uh, is that a criteria, is that a criteria to, uh, to, uh, to uh, conclude uh, contracts uh, to terminate contracts uh, with uh, respective suppliers uh, that uh, uh, have been found to commit um, abuse. That question was to cast in my. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, right. sie ist jetzt äh, gerade nicht äh, äh, that Kerstin die Frage war an Kerstin May äh, gerichtet. With us. This question was, uh, okay, dann äh, würde ich sagen, machen wir weiter. Wir machen, wir versuchen May. das in einer äh, in that case, zweiten uh, Runde nochmal. Uh, um, we'll come back to it later. Um, I'd like to introduce Christina Hayegos Klausen. She is the Director for the Textile and Garment Industry Section of Industry or Global Union. You have been at the forefront of fighting for better working conditions in the global garment industry. You have been instrumental in uh, implementing the Bangladesh Accord. You are the uh, uh, trade union representative in, on the board of the ready made uh, Garment Sustainability Council, and you may wish to briefly talk about uh, that uh, uh, as well. So, Bangladesh Accord, what is uh, the uh, experience that Industrial has made with it? Um, what um, would you say would, uh, is necessary to have uh, uh, to uh, yeah, to have a legally binding, a fully legally binding in, in instrument uh, at the global level. Thanks, Horst, and uh, guten Tag zu alle. That's my only German for today. Um, though I do speak a little bit of German, I just wanted to, I'll do my presentation and inter intervention in English. So yes, as Kalpona mentioned, the Bangladesh Accord for Building and Fire Safety has been uh, quite instrumental in uh, fixing the system in Bangladesh, the building. I think it was very clear one of the main components around the Bangladesh Accord and now its successor agreement, the International Accord, is that it's an ability to pull the leverage of the brands and work together with global trade unions to solve systemic problems in the supply chain. So I think um, that's a key component. And the other key component, as Kalpona mentioned, um, is that it has a dispute resolution mechanism that is binding on the brand. So if we cannot solve disputes between the parties, uh, there is a way to have um, international arbitration at the permanent court of arbitration in The Hague. 
Um, but let me just step back a little bit and try to contextualize uh, the work that we do in industrial. And I want to uh, thank Kirsten and Calpona for sharing those valuable interventions on improving working conditions along the supply chain. Um, so to put these in more of a larger context, um, how these experiences have contributed to ensure that multinational enterprises are held accountable, Industrial Global Union, um, we have a political position that agreements with multinational enterprises need to be binding on the parties. Um, as I just mentioned before, in the textile and garment sector, the newly negotiated International Accord, uh, which has already 148 global brands and retailers uh, signing uh, the individual agreement with Industrial and Global Uni, um, further validates a new supply chain model of industrial relations one that is centered around binding rules to hold brands accountable for their impact on workers rather than voluntary initiatives. Um, specifically, the International Accord uh, has a provision for dispute resolution, um, and this dispute resolution mechanism is where it becomes legally binding. Um, so there is this agreed upon process that the parties can proceed to a, find, a final and binding arbitration process that's enforceable in a court of law where the signatory is domiciled. So I think that's really important fundamental uh, piece of work that uh, we've worked on in the textile and garment sector. Um, this is a real departure from the failed auditing models um, in that it, one, it really provides access to remedy. I mean, I think that's one of the key uh, components uh, of the work that's been done under the accord. and now the future uh, uh, international accord, is that there's a way for workers to find remedy. Um, it's clearly a move towards a model of supply chain industrial relations with trade unions monitoring compliance and holding multinational enterprises accountable. Um, further, uh, in industrial's recent global Congress, affiliates unanimously decided uh, to introduce binding conflict resolution as a new element in our further work or, and development around global framework agreements. Despite all these efforts, I'd like to add that with global framework agreements and sectoral agreements, such as the uh, Bangladesh Accord and now the International Accord, um, there is a weakness in this system that I think can only be changed with a UN binding treaty on, on business and human rights. And that's the sense that uh, only companies who want to engage uh, in this process uh, do so, right? So it's almost building a two-tiered system uh, where some workers have more protection. If you look at Bangladesh, for example, uh, factories that were covered under the Accord uh, model uh, have clearly uh, safer working conditions than factories of brands who might not have signed the Accord and are not under this safety inspection. So it is worrisome that in the in the supply chain uh, work that there is an ability for some global brands who don't want to uh, fulfill their human rights due diligence can get a pass. They're under the radar. Uh, so the mm -hmm. playing field isn't level. So I really feel that um, uh, this is something there's a weakness on, even though we've done great work in trade unions through their solidarity and campaigning and negotiating these agreements and working them out between, you know, in a tripartite fashion between brands, industry, and unions, there's still uh, uh, companies that, you know, are in the, in the sector all across the globe that just sort of fly under the radar and they're getting benefits actually from work that other companies are doing. So this is a this is really where we see, and I know we're going to talk about, you're going to have other speakers, so I will conclude my remarks here, but this is really where we see a UN treaty on business and human rights. Um, it's needed to create that level playing field. And um, let me turn it back over to you, Horst, because just on time, and we have some really good speakers coming after. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina. Um, and uh, I would uh, now um, ask Verena Schmidt to come in. Verena is a senior specialist for the International Labour Organization for many years, uh, among others.
questions of uh, global governance in the vast uh, uh, field where uh, Rena has expertise. And uh, maybe uh, you could enlighten us uh, very briefly on uh, what kind of multilateral standards the ILO is setting, um, not only the conventions and recommendations, but what is it uh, that the ILO is uh, trying to do? And maybe you could also, because we haven't actually talked about the third draft of uh, the treaty that is presently on the table, give uh, some kind of an assessment where uh, we are. And that in 10 minutes, as always. Thank you very much. Uh, vielen Dank, Horst, uh, und vielen Dank uh, für die Einladung uh, für dieses. Thank you so much, Horst, and thank you also for the invitation to this panel on the UN Treaty. I'm really glad that IG, IG Metall and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation have invited me because unions play a key role here. And it's really a question of the trade unions if we can manage to get a binding agreement and if it will help to actually enforce human rights and social rights in the respective enterprises. So the ELO does not have a unanimous position on supply chains and the treaty. The working group of the employers wants a new instrument on a human rights due diligence. So they want a recommendation or a treaty or maybe even both things. The employees is what they want. However, the group of the employers don't see that there is a change needed and the government is, of course, divided. Our administration council has come up with a working group who will actually provide a recommendation, a proposal until March 2022 on how to further the process. So concerning the discussion of supply chains, we have to distinguish between soft law and hard law. Soft law are um, non-binding agreements or also um, voluntary agreements. And there's the hard law, which refers to legally binding instruments. So soft law is less strict. However, that doesn't mean that it's effective less. And I get to host questions here. An important example, or even the most example for soft law is the declaration from 98 on the principles and rights on principles and rights of works that all ILO member states signed and the member states who signed it obliges them to actually imply these regulations. So this was a landmark decision. I will talk about it more later. Another example for soft law is the declaration of multinationals that was revised in 2017. And section 10F is of a special importance because it says that the freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining is important and it needs to include discussions and dialogue with federations and associations. And concerning the draft of a UN treaty, I want to mention a couple of more things. So from our perspective, it's important that it always refers to our ILO agreement and it, that it always refers to the core labor standards of the ILO, especially when it comes to violence, gender-based violence. So this is important for us. So violence and harassment need to be included. In the draft treaty, 
it says that the contractual states need to respect human rights and need to sanction if these rights are infringed or not fulfilled. However, the ILO does not have a stand or position on that. From my personal experience, I can say that I can always see limits when it comes to non-binding agreements. So from my personal point of view, I think that a legally binding UN treaty could be a step forward to really respecting and fulfilling human rights. And trade unions play a key role in this process because they make an access to remedy possible. Thank you very much, Horst. Thank you, Verena. So Kerstin and Kalpona presented the perspective from Enterprises for Trade Unions. Christina and Verena tried to contextualize the things that were said. And now in our third step, we want to try to actually regard it from the perspective of three important stakeholders. So the necessity of a legally binding UN treaty is now being discussed from, a pers from, from three different perspectives. So we have different guests that will now present their perspectives from their respective um, points of views. And I want to start with Helmut Scholz. He's a member of the European Parliament. He's also a member of the Committee for Trade Relations. So what is necessary in order to have this binding UN treaty? And maybe as a question, as a first question, what do you think, how is the debate going in the European Parliament? Because this debate is also the reason why the uh, Commission will present a draft soon. So how are things going? What's your opinion on that? Thank you, first of all, for the invitation and this interesting debate. So, of course, it's a topic that we've been discussing for years in the European Parliament. And also, we try to monitor different parliamentary groups in Genf, parliamentary groups that work in the field of supply chains and human rights due diligence. So this applies to a lot of different countries, and it also has to do with the legislation of the European Union. And I heard that the EU Commission is not part of the discussions right now. They said that they have other work to do. And I think this shows us very clearly that these two processes are strictly um, or very closely related. So what's necessary? We need a political will. We need the political will of the legislators, of the governments, of all member states, of all 127 member states to actually want human rights due diligence. So concerning environmental standards and social rights and human rights, all of these things need to be included in the treaty. And there needs to be a voluntary political will to actually want to imply these things. 
And during the next years, we need to change the policies so that they can actually implement the SDGs. So as politicians and as decision makers, we really have to make sure that we advance. So one point of criticism that I have that I think is really impressing that comes from many people that are involved in the UN binding treaty So they all say that there needs to be a political will. We need to actually push the governments and states into this direction. So I think this is also an aspect of democracy. However, we have not reached the point yet where employees that work in the factories actually count as much. Their voices aren't visible enough yet. So employees are not involved enough in the decision-making processes within an enterprise. So we need to think or go one step further. That's why I'm also thankful for this seminar. We need to get to the point where the states act according to the things that they've promised. They promise all of these things in the governments, in the summits, in the media. So there is a lot of media coverage and we speak a lot about the things that are necessary for a change. And the ministries, the politicians, they always talk about it as well. However, it's our responsibility responsibility that we continue to exercise pressure on the governments and politicians we have to stick to supervising monitoring the un treaty process and we have to focus on the eu commission and we must push them to negotiate because we can't allow them to actually step out of the process or actually only um, talk a lot, but don't act. So what we must do is act in a democratic manner. We need a lot of pressure from or on behalf of the trade unions. We need more trade union struggles. And our goal has to be influencing and exercising, putting pressure on the governments and states. We need to put pressure on economic associations. And that's why getting an agreement is, is, is of course, important. But it, this holds true for the supply chain law as well. And uh, even if, if we just, uh, is it enforce, even if it's just in the EU or um, enforceable in the EU, um, and there's, there's a heavy debate um, about uh, the criminal liability of corporations and what role does that play for the, um, um, for the, for the rules that will be enshrined into, into law. Um, so um, this debate has been um, postponed uh, to December, and I hope after uh, COP26, and um, I hope that we will end up with a viable uh, draft and that we will uh, be able to also submit to the negotiations in Geneva. Um, Thank you, Helmut Scholz. Uh, Dr. Carsten Stender, head of the Department uh, 6 um, on European and International Employment and Social Policy. Um, you've been working on these uh, topics for a number of years. I remember um, one specific event um, 
about a year ago when you headed the uh, European uh, Council, uh, when we had the presidency of the, of the European Council, where we talked about uh, business and human rights in the European, in the EU context. Uh, and as a trade union, and uh, that's just a side note, uh, we always uh, saw you as an ally when we uh, uh, were addressing these questions. Now, the supply chain due diligence law um, is, has, is in place. Does that change something about the attitude and the actions of the German government when it comes to the UN treaty? Because uh, up until recently, the German government uh, did not want to get involved in, in, in that. Uh, in the negotiations for a UN treaty. And we know very well that this is the EU context and there may be uh, mandates or the lack of mandates um, uh, in that context, but has there changed anything uh, with respect to the attitude and the actions uh, uh, of the German uh, government? Um, and of course, um, there would be a lot of uh, uh, side notes to um, uh, to make for that, but what's your general assessment? Uh, and please uh, make sure that you switch on your mic. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for that question. Um, with regard to your question, whether something has changed or will change, um, I can only say I hope. Uh, I hope so uh, very much. You talked about my situation. I um, speak on behalf of a German government uh, that uh, has limited uh, powers at the moment. Um, and when it comes to the question of a binding treaty, was very hesitant um, in the past to come to an agreement. Um, and that is related to what Verena um, uh, told us about the ILO, the ILO, uh, which is that a part of the government uh, uh, banked on the principle of voluntary uh, measures and voluntary regulations, and there were others who supported and favored uh, uh, legally binding uh, regulations. With respect to the German uh, law, we solved it in a way that we adopted a monitoring instrument um, to see whether uh, most of the German corporations would actually uh, uh, adopt uh, the, uh, the voluntary uh, measures. And um, we have a national action plan to enforce the uh, UNGP and, uh, and uh, based on that, we were able to adopt a German uh, law. Uh, we are still in the coalition negotiations, so we do not have an operating uh, uh, German government yet, but I can only um, uh, share with you uh, my view and my expectations from the perspective of the Federal Ministry for Labor and uh, Social Affairs, and also as a member of the uh, um, um, uh, trade of a trade union and uh, based on that or from that perspective we now uh, need to move away from voluntary uh, instruments but we uh, and need to uh, have um, and, and bring about um, and put all our efforts into a, a legally binding uh, treaty at all levels at uh, national level at um, at EU level and uh, on international level uh, with John Ruggie and the UNGP, we have to uh, recognize that um, if we dilute, if we water down the draft uh, as in, in the negotiations um, from the original draft, uh, if that draft is being diluted, uh, it will be much harder to um, gain international acceptance for that because the UNGP are very well-founded and uh, and a working concept um, and a, um, 
are very good as a as an instrument, but the EU governments and uh, other governments uh, have already started working with the UNGP and have enshrined their management and process uh, procedural standards into national law. Um, the question whether an international agreement uh, for EU countries will be uh, they will be able to ratify that. Uh, that will depend m uh, mostly on whether the, the, the uh, concept is in line with uh, European and national uh, EU and national legislation. And these are concepts that are associated with the UNGP. So my hope is that the process in Geneva uh, will move us towards a concretization and uh, uh, towards a state where the UNGP will be legally uh, binding, will be made legally binding. Um, there has been criticism voiced vis-à-vis uh, -vis the uh, um, against the um, EU position. As Germany, we have to recognize that uh, we are just one member state of the European Union, and we talk about matters that are of a collective concern uh, in the European Union. And the European Union um, uh, bodies uh, cannot uh, take recommendations uh, from individual member states about uh, what they are supposed to do and how they are supposed to work and to do their work. But speaking about the upcoming uh, legislature in Germany, we will work uh, to bring about a constructive approach uh, um, uh, at the UN, a uh, uh, con constructive approach vis-à-vis -vis these uh, international efforts to bring about a legally binding uh, treaty. Uh, the um, uh, the, we could not analyze uh, all the uh, provisions that are part of the uh, draft yet. Um, and I hope that we hope or we uh, would wish uh, for um, uh, Germany and the European Union to, to get involved, uh, actively involved in uh, uh, drafting such a, um, a binding treaty and uh, to get, get actively involved uh, in the negotiations as well. And I think we uh, could follow the example of the US that could be uh, inspiring to the European Union as well. I would also ask for your understanding because they are in a very uncomfortable and inconvenient position as long as there's no agreement on the EU proposal on um, a corporate responsibility. Because... Uh, uh, the uh, standard that is being set uh, by the UN, um, um, we can only live up to that if we uh, uh, have the same standards and if we live up to the same standards at the European Union level. So I think we uh, will have uh, negotiations and we will have to convene uh, at the 8th of December. We need to bring about uh, a legally binding uh, a proposal for a legally binding treaty at EU level, and that will resolve then the issue of uh, uh, the position of the European Union within the UN negotiations. Let me also say that uh, uh, we are a couple of weeks uh, away from um, the EU presidency, and responsibility and accountability in supply chains is up is part of the agenda. Uh, at the G7, um, and we will see, that's the presidency of the G7, and we will bring it up uh, in the uh, uh, discussions there, and uh, we think that uh, also uh, with respect to this uh, topic, the G7 uh, should speak with one voice and should come to an agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, also thank you for pointing out the um, uh, the G7 presidency. I saw that uh, Helmut wanted to uh, come in. I think you wanted to respond directly to that. So I'll give you the floor before we move on to Wolfgang Lemp. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. I'd like to uh, thank you, Carsten Stender, for this uh, very clear uh, uh, positioning. Um, I I can understand and I can relate to that. I know uh, what is happening uh, at the uh, Council and the European Commission and 
uh, that you are in a difficult position as a European Commission. The problem, however, is that, uh, or the issue, we've been pointing out uh, for a very long time, uh, the Council has to give the mandate to the uh, 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 to the Commission or to the EAS uh, as this as the um, body that is uh, a part of the negotiations in Geneva. So uh, we cannot uh, simply um, point fingers at the others uh, and say we are not responsible. Um, the others are um, that uh, will not help with um, the presidency of the G7 and the new uh, government. We will have to be at the forefront uh, of uh, uh, the struggle for uh, a legally binding UN treaty. Friends of the Earth Europe and uh, many other uh, international NGOs and actors, they have very clear demands. Submit a recommendation to the Council to agree a common position and abstain a mandate uh, for the legally binding treaty um, um, by the eighth uh, session. That is the minimum, because it will take another year. We will lose another year. Um, uh, Social Democrats, the, the Greens, uh, the Liberals, um, and the left in the European Parliament, we uh, hope that we can move together um, and um, make efforts to move into that direction uh, together. So... Uh, translating, uh, uh, you have also a responsibility and a role to play when it comes to translating uh, the uh, uh, EU um, legislation, international law as well. Thank you for this comment. Uh, I would like to pass the floor to Wolfgang Lemp. Um, he is a member of the Metal Workers Union, of the Board of the Metal Workers Union, IG Metall, and was in charge of the transnational um, work Wolfgang, maybe you can speak a bit on the German law. Uh, how do you assess the uh, supply chain due diligence law? I saw in the chat that there, there were uh, comments that uh, uh, it doesn't really do much, uh, that it's powerless, uh, that it's a toothless tiger. What uh, is your assessment and what is what would be your response? Thank you. Um, and thank you for your inputs. I think it's a really important discussion in that context um, uh, on these uh, topics uh, that we uh, can all agree on, I think. Uh, Horst, you know that many colleagues um, uh, are also familiar with that. Uh, the Metal Workers Union um, has uh, worked um, uh, to bring about uh, this German supply chain law together with a German initiative. So we were at the forefront of this uh, struggle. Uh, there was a German initiative to um, uh, bring about such a law as well, uh, made up of many associations. And we just decided recently that we as a metal workers union, we want to continue uh, being engaged and being involved in this initiative for the next uh, two years at least, uh, which uh, uh, tells you uh, something about the time frame we are working with, um, and where we will see whether or not uh, the law is a toothless tiger in, in indeed or it isn't. Of course, we are not a hundred percent. We don't think we are not. Um, we don't agree with everything, and we are not um, uh, um, satisfied 100% uh, with that law. However, we are uh, happy that we have gotten uh, so far and that we have this law now, you know, based on the negotiations and based on the work that we have uh, did. I deal a lot of, with... Uh, industrial policies and with uh, business and uh, employers associations and I had to talk uh, to them um, I had to have that conversation with them in this debate uh, whether or not we actually do need uh, a German supply chain law and there was a German debate and that German debate is related to what Helmut Scholz pointed at as well 
because we point fingers and we try to um, um, say that we are not responsible in Germany and uh, and blame Europe um, and say that uh, Europe does not live up to its its responsibility. Um, so it is a, a good thing to have this uh, German uh, supply chain law. And I also wanted to say that uh, apart from this um, this criticism uh, or the, this uh, this defensive uh, attitude from the uh, associations and there are other and there are uh, companies and Bosch is among them and uh, BMW uh, v uh, VW uh, Volkswagen and other car companies Scheffler Siemens or Conti are among them as well these corporations and they are uh, major uh, corporations in Germany, they all were in favor um, of and supported a supply chain law. Uh, we have to recognize that as well at the shop floor level, at the company level, and uh, at the level, at the corporate level, they recognize that this is necessary. So this initiative of the works councils from these uh, corporations and companies is really uh, crucial and decisive. Uh, also, with respect to what we expect uh, from the EU regulation, the EU directive, um, and what are my expectations? Well, my expectations, well, let me put it this way. We hope that we can have stronger uh, regulations uh, at EU level than we currently have uh, at, the, at the German level. Uh, that is what has been. That was the message uh, from the EU that uh, they do not uh, discount uh, that possibility that, to have strong regulations at EU level. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, a stronger regulation in 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 our sense, um, and that would be helpful also for our national debate in in Germany that we do have at the moment and after the uh, now it has uh, died down a little bit this debate uh, because it has been adopted but uh, once uh, it enters into force uh, i think this debate will flare up again i and i think i think uh, we can be that's very obvious um, as German unions with industry, all uh, global union and the European uh, Trade Union Federation, we can prepare for that. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. Thank you to all participants. Also, thank you for sticking to your time frame. We had 90 minutes. And now we have 15 minutes left. There are some questions in the chat, and I will start with one thing that was posted. So you can't click on all links that were posted. So I would like to ask the organizers of this event to save all links so that all the participants can actually message the organizers and ask for the links after this session. I want to get back to my first question, the question that was addressed to Kerstin May. So within the Bosch Global Framework Agreement, Would it be a reason to cancel contract with suppliers if the supplier oppresses union um, actions or if it suppresses employees that try to organize in a union? So, Kerstin May, what can you say about the question? So it's not part of the contractual agreement. However, we have not experienced the situation. However, the first thing is always to eliminate weaknesses. 
So whether it's a social problem or a technological problem, it's always about eliminating problems or the weaknesses first before canceling the contract. So we always try to improve the situation first before we cancel a contract because in the worst case the problem would only be shifted from one supplier to the next supplier so for us it's always important to actually clarify the problem and try to solve it and if necessary we also use public pressure and push them to actually cancel contracts we would try to push bosch to cancel contracts however um, we also reach certain limits here. It's also always a question of the rule of law. Sometimes we try to um, facilitate conflicts when we're in another country, and then it's also complicated because there are different um, laws, there are different cultures. It's not always possible to decide what's good and bad, what's correct and what's not. And um, we only have to look at Europe if we have complaints on a European level. It's also not always possible to understand, to fully understand what the problem is about. So we always try to solve the problems first before we cancel contracts. And um, Bosch itself also obliges itself to stick and commit to these regulations. That's why this is the way forward. Okay, thank you for the explanation. I have a comment here, a rather general comment that was posted in the chat. It refers to the ILO and the different employee groups. So they demand that the ILO, the ILO should actually commit to a legally binding framework and a legally binding treaty more. Verina also, also um, already pointed this out in her presentation. Is that something that the ILO can do? Is it something that the ILO is allowed to do? if there are such demands. Thank you, and thanks to Ramon for, for this question. Thank uh, you to Ramon for this question, and thank you, Horst. So if we take a look at the UN debate, the ILO is not really playing an essential role. We are just observers. I think for the ILO itself, the question is, important in the sense that um, ILO will enter into a discussion on a treaty or on a recommendation on due diligence and supply chains in general. So we had the working group of employees that have been demanded this for a long time, so we know this demand. And we also had three experts meetings concerning this topic. The last meeting was about the question whether or not to have a standard. However, the employers um, stopped this discussion. They didn't want to discuss the resolution further. So it's really a, not a good starting point. We hope that we will find a compromise within this working group that will also be adopted by the Administrative Council. However, I think that the main task of the ILO is creating our own standards because we're not directly involved in the UN process. In this context, the ELO supervisory system is also important. It's important to use this system because this can help to interpret um, conventions because often it's referred to the ILO core labor standards. However, people don't actually 
try to understand how they can be implemented. In Myanmar, for example, the trade union filed a complaint to the ELO. Um, it went to the Committee for Freedom of Association. And already in May, there was a statement that you can quote very well. I'm going to post this link in the chat because the more um, statements from this report um, are quoted, the more influence the ELO also has. So I think um, this is also an instrument that could be used. Of course, it's not always easy to find these instruments. However, I think this is something, a tool that the unions can use to exercise even more pressure. Thank you, Verena. I'm switching to uh, English now because there's a question to any of the speakers uh, and the question is in English. So rather than me translating it, uh, um, I just want to put it to any of you who feels uh, like trying to respond to it. And the question is, um, is there an internal UN, ILO, European Union way to go forward or is media pressure and pressure from the bottom? The street uh, required is nego negotiation with arguments uh, successful at all so that is a strategic question uh, for the actors maybe all, uh, trade you on the trade union side um, so who wants to give his or her view christina yeah, maybe I'll take this one because it is an important uh, piece that trade unions are really uh, able to mobilize members around these difficult questions. And we all know that, you know, without a struggle, it's really hard to achieve our end objective. So I do think that's something, you know, it's important to be in these institutions and have negotiations and argue over language and all that. But there is a something fundamental that's quite important to uh, mobilize our mm. membership around these issues because these are issues that impact them uh, at home. I mean, even Kirsten's experience of in Bosch really like shows that that it it does have uh, impact. And how Kapona talked about you know what workers have had to do in Bangladesh and what we've done globally to uh, move towards a binding agreement about on health and safety for the textile sector. So there is real value in that. So I think that is definitely something as trade unions, we need to uh, look and see how it can be uh, deployed strategically and, uh, in, and in, uh, uh, what's the right word? I'm not, I've lost it in English. Uh, pressure, use our leverage in, at the right moment. So thanks. Yeah. So I was me unmute uh, muted myself so uh, thank you very thank you very much uh, christina um unless someone wants to take the floor uh, and we are approaching 2 30 in europe at least um let me just say uh, this um, event has a bias towards the global north um, and no reason to apologize for that, but I wanted um, to ask you, uh, Kalpuna, in what way is this discussion that we have had uh, today relevant to you? Where uh, could uh, the treaty or any other instrument be of help uh, for your work uh, and the, uh, well, well, the attempt to improve the difficult working conditions of the uh, colleagues, the sisters and brothers that you represent? Yeah, I mean, thank you. It will indeed help, okay? So when uh, we are talking about UNDP binding treaty, who we are talking about, to, we're definitely talking about to improve the conditions in the supply chain, in the business, and definitely that impact, that will be a positive impact for our workers. It's, that really happens. So my take on from, I mean, we have been talking about this here, uh, not in a bigger, you know, larger scale, but, you know, in a smaller scale, we have been discussing and we are also trying to speak to our government that what is our national action plan regarding uh, business and human rights principles. 
So when we are talking that in within our union, and if we have, uh, if we can, you know, uh, do a straight movement, do a bottom up pressure, then I believe that we will feel that we also own, uh, you know, this process uh, when, where we are asking this uh, binding treaty. So if we have this binding treaty, definitely it will be helping our workers uh, in the bottom of the supply chain. Thank you very much, uh, Kalpuna. And um, let me also thank uh, uh, each and everybody uh, who made uh, this event today uh, possible. Um, <clears throat> Carola Franz and Till Bender from the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Stiftung, Caroline Seitz from the Global Policy Forum, uh, Christina Ayagos uh, from Industry All, and all uh, the panelists. Uh, and um, I'm sure this will definitely not be the last one. Uh, uh, when on our way to a global uh, treaty, if I look back uh, at how long it took to have a um, uh, Lieferkettengesetz in Germany, I, I, I'm sure that we'll meet again in this or in other, uh, let's say, composition. So thank you very much. Um, you uh, panelists made my life as a moderator very, very uh, simple. And um, I would miss uh, my job if I did not thank the interpreters who made the communication uh, between uh, English and German speakers possible. So thank you very much. Uh, and this is to be continued. Have a nice day and all the best. Bye-bye.